Welcome. It's wonderful to be with you. You know that uh, I've already uh, broadcast two treasures from the Rabbi's Library. Here is episode number three of our series, and it's a pleasure to be with you. And I'd like to welcome you to my library. I'd like to welcome you to my Arba Amois, where I have the most pleasure because I'm together with my wonderful books and all the treasures that I've collected over many years, and I take great pleasure in sharing them with you. I want to begin today by talking about my grandfather. So my grandfather, Rabbi Yosef Tzvi Dunner, was the Rosh Abbezdin in London for many, many years. In fact, he was appointed in 1959. He died in 2007. And throughout that period of time, he was the Rav of Adas Yisrael Shul in Stamford Hill in London. And he was also the Rosh Av Bezdin in London, of the Bezdin of the Union of Hebrew Orthodox Congregations, which is the Haredi community in London. Here is a photograph that I have that was taken at the bris of my son, Mayer, uh, where he attended. I, he, you know, I gave a pilpul there and he was so pleased. He was so delighted and he sat next to me. We had a wonderful evening together. So I want to tell you that I can't remember the exact year, but at some point in the early 2000s, my grandparents moved from their home at 69 Allerton Road in Stamford Hill, and they moved to Schoenfeld Square. Schoenfeld Square was a facility that was created initially for uh, um, people who required constant help, 24-hour help, uh, people in their elderly years, but it subsequently became a housing facility, and one of the housing facilities was made available for my grandparents. It was an absolutely wonderful thing, and we transported his library from 69 Allerton Road, where he had lived since 1947, and I can't remember the exact year, but it was, let's say, roughly the year 2000. We moved it to Schoenfeld Square, to his house there. Sadly enough, my grandmother uh, was transferred to the nursing home in that facility, in that area. But my grandfather remained and lived there until 2007. My grandmother passed away in 2010. Uh, and when my grandfather passed away in 2007, we had to empty the home, the house where he'd lived, since roughly the year 2000, I can't remember the exact year, and I was asked if I could make sure that all the treasures of the library were preserved, and I did so. And I'm, you know, I'm delighted that the piece that I'm about to show you is in my possession because it is a piece of history. So we have here a sefer called Darke Tshuva. Darke Tshuva was written by the Rav of Munkaj. It was published. It's a very, very important sefer on Yeridea. Anybody who has taken smicha will know that Darke Tshuva is one of the key svarim that you need to study in order to get your smicha. It contains the uh, crucial information uh, collected uh, from all the different various sources so that you can uh, know exactly what it is that you're learning and understand the piske halocha relating to Yeridea. Now, there was a Rabbi Dunna long before my grandfather who, who was called Rabbi Yosef Tzvi Dunna. He was the original Rabbi Yosef Tzvi Dunna. My grandfather's name was Rabbi Yosef Tzvi Dunna. We'll get to that in a moment. Rabbi Yosef Tzvi Dunna was a, an interesting man. He went from a village in what is now Slovakia, went to Krakow, and became a tutor, a Hebrew tutor, and studied in some Bismedrush there, became 
a fabulous Talmud Chochem, and he was a tutor. He was involved very much with Chayva Veitzion, which annoyed the people in Krakow, who didn't like the fact that there was somebody who was teaching their children who was involved with Chayva Veitzion. In fact, they got very physical with him. I understand that he ended up in hospital because he taught some of the children that he was involved with. He taught them about the importance of Eretz Yisrael and of striving to move to Eretz Yisrael and to live in Eretz Yisrael. And there were people who were against that, and one of the parents got physical with him. He ended up in hospital, as a result of which he moved to Germany. He felt that the atmosphere in Galicia was too intolerant. He moved to Germany. And as a result of that, his entire family moved to Germany. He had three brothers, one of whom was my great-grandfather's father, uh, Avraham Moshe. My father was named after him, Avraham Moshe Duna, Abba Duna. And Avraham Moshe was a brother of Rav Yosef Tzvi Duna. Rav Yosef Tzvi Duna um, was studied in university and in yeshiva in Germany and ended up as the rector, the um, leading rabbi of the rabbinical seminary in Holland, in Amsterdam, ultimately chief rabbi of Amsterdam. And in the end, he was the chief rabbi of Holland. Here's a picture of him. A very, very chosh of a person. He published Svarim. Uh, the Svarim that he published were Chidushe uh, Rabbi Yosef Tzvi Duna. And they, uh, they were a little strange because he clearly didn't study in the regular yeshivas and he didn't have the um, understanding of the Gemaras, some of the Gemaras which he explained and not explained in the way that we in the, from the yeshiva world would accept. Nevertheless, he was a person who was completely committed as a Shema Torah mitzvah and as someone who was against Reform Judaism and he established a very powerful Orthodox community in Holland as the Chief Rabbi of Holland. He died in 1912. Okay, that's the history of Rabbi Yosef Tzvi Duner. I'm sure you'll look him up, you'll search him up, you'll Google him, you'll find out a little more about him. He was an extraordinary individual and he achieved great things in Holland for the Frum community in Holland. My grandfather was born in 1913. He was the first person to be named Yosef Tzvi after his great uncle, his grandfather's brother, Yosef Tzvi Duna, who was the chief rabbi of Holland. When he was named Yosef Tzvi Duna, the family in Holland sent him a number of books which came from Rabbi Yosef Tzvi Duna's library. They felt that as the first person who was named after their esteemed forebear, that my grandfather, still a baby, should receive at least some of his books because at least at some point in his life he will gain benefit from them as somebody who bears his name. I'm going to fast forward the 9th of November, 1938. My grandfather was the chief rabbi of Konigsberg. He was actually the chief rabbi of East Prussia. Konigsberg was the capital of East Prussia. The 9th of November is a night which is infamous, remembered because it was the great pogrom that began the Holocaust. On the 9th of November, 1938, German thugs throughout Germany attacked Jewish communities, burnt down shuls, and attacked anybody who was associated with Jewish leadership. My grandfather, who was the chief rabbi, a young man, he was in his early 20s, was sleeping, and suddenly in the middle of the night, he heard a commotion outside his door. They broke down his door, they attacked him, and they dragged him away and he was arrested and he was put in prison. Thankfully, and this is a, a complete miracle, because there was a strip of land called the Polish Corridor between East Prussia and mainland Germany, that was a result of the Versailles Conference and the agreement after the First World War, he was not able to be transported to Dachau, which was a concentration camp, and he wasn't killed. And he was able to obtain a visa, which 
brought him to the United Kingdom, to England, to Great Britain, and that's why I'm alive. But on that night, the Nazis came into his apartment and they destroyed his library. Why am I telling you this? Because when I helped to collect and give out, distribute my grandfather's library in 2007 after he was Nifta, I was able to give out all the Svarim that he had used over many, many years. There was one safer that caught my eye, and I asked my uncles and my family if they want it. They said they don't, and I kept it. It's a museum piece. It's a remarkable piece. Here it is. So this is a safer that was sent by the family of Rabbi Yosef Tzvi Dunner, Josef Hirsch Dunner, the chief rabbi of Amsterdam as a result of the fact that my grandfather was named Yosef Tzvi Dunner. It's a dark etruva, this sefer which is in Yeridea, which is really only useful for people who train for Abonus, who train to become rabbis. It's a remarkable sefer, and it's the only volume of this particular set of dark etruva which I found in my grandfather's library. He had a full set of Dark Chuva, but it was a later edition. Now, when I flicked through it, I discovered that the reason that he had it, by the way, I did this when he was alive, not after he passed away. The reason he had it was because when the Nazis came in and destroyed his library, they took this particular safer off the shelf and they ripped the pages. Do you see that? That is the result of Nazi anti-Semitism, hatred of Jews. This chunk of papers that was ripped in this dark etruva, this is 59 sheets of paper. Do you know how hard it is to rip 59 sheets of paper? This was ripped by a Nazi on Kristallnacht who hated Jews so much that he took a book that he didn't understand off the shelf and ripped the pages inside it to demonstrate his hatred of Jews. My grandfather kept this safer, and although he bought himself another set of Dark Yichuva, and I have that as well, he nevertheless kept this safer as a reminder of the great miracle that he experienced together with his family, my grandmother, my father, and those who were born as a result of the fact that he moved to Great Britain and was saved from the Holocaust. He kept this safer as a reminder of the incredible, incredible miracles that Hashem allowed him to experience enabling him to survive the Holocaust. And every time he looked at this Sefer, he realized that it was, in some sense, not predestined that he should survive because the hatred of the Nazis was so great that they could take a book off a shelf and rip the pages out of that book, a book they could literally not understand simply because Somebody was telling them that Jews were evil. That is the dark etchuva, I have it to my shelf, and it is a remarkable testament to the survival of my own family and the survival of the Jewish nation. I'm talking about my grandfather, so I'm delighted to be able to present this particular piece which I found in a box, which I've been looking at because we're in this situation where we're wasting a lot of time doing things that we would never normally do. So those of you who recall, there was a man, a great man, called the Satmar Rebbe. The Satmar Rebbe, Rabbi Yoel Teitelbaum, was a vehement anti-Zionist. That means he refused to accept that the State of Israel had any bearing on Judaism. He felt it was an aberration, and he projected that concept, that idea, and that ideal 
to anybody who fell within his vicinity, who was in his sphere, and he dominated to a certain extent a certain aspect or certain amount of the Hasidic world. And when he died in 1979, there was a shift, at least in one section of the Hasidic world, against that uh, concept, against that Weltanschauung, and that was by the Belzer Rebbe. The Belzer Rebbe, Rebero Rokach, was a young man at that stage. He was born in the late 1940s, son of the Bulgaria Rov, a nephew of Rabbi Arla Belzer. He became the Belzer Rebbe in the 1960s because Belz continued to exist and he turned into, into a significant Hasidic community. But they fell to some extent under the um, influence of the Eid Haredus, which is the anti-Zionist community of Jerusalem. And after the Satmar Rebbe died, the Belzer Rebbe decided that he was going to set up his own community, the community of Machzike Hadas. What is Machzike Hadas? Machzike Hadas was the Bells community that existed in Galicia before the Holocaust. He felt that he didn't want to continue in this very negative environment of the anti Zionist Eide Haredes community, and he established himself as. Bells, an independent Bells community called Machziki Hadas. He associated himself with Aguda, later on with Dagal Hatera and Rav Shach, and he refused to accept the very dominant influence of Satma from America that was very much controlling the Eide Haredes community, the, uh, the community in Eretz Yisrael which refused to accept any aspect of the Zionist world. Uh, some years ago, uh, and I don't remember where or from whom I bought this, I bought a collection of polemics relating to the decision of the Bells community to remove themselves, exclude themselves from the Eide Haredes. So we see here, Haheskim Shari Bahafirasai, this is Dvarim Kavyosam. This is a record of the dispute between Bells and the Eide Haredes. And this continued. It was a terrible, terrible dispute. Um, this is another um, pair of polemics against the Bells community. B'nei Belial Ashahinu Ledaber Sora Lenabel PM Bedivre Bella Vazus Shein Hadas of Lossom Vasha Nivza Me Etonu La Haloison Alaxav Kalape Moire Hadores Vapoira Kodesh Ushalaim Miaste de Haridus Sorfe Malo Terrible, terrible things written against those who refuse to accept the authority of the Eide Haridus in Jerusalem the original Haredi or ultra-Orthodox community that controlled all the affairs of the Haredi community. And this was a community that broke away and that was terrible, a terrible price to pay for the, um, for the, for the Bells community. Ma'cho'a mevu'ag be'gmara Sanhedrin da'mavaze tamudchocham nivkro apikoros Anybody who embarrasses or impugns the honor of a great Jewish Torah scholar is considered to be a heretic. He doesn't have any place in the world to come. This is um, a macho against the Belzer Rebbe and all those who supported him. Now the community still exists and it didn't survive. The reason I'm telling you why I was interested in this particular um, file that I found is because I recall an incident that took place in the early 1980s. I can't remember if it was 1981 or 1982. My grandfather, the Yosef Sviduna, who I just mentioned as one of the principal rabbis of London, 
was told that the Belzer Rebbe was coming to London. Now I have to tell you, at that time, the Satmar community was extremely strong in London, and they made it clear that anybody who engaged with the Belzer Rebbe would be their enemy. Quite a number of the leading rabbis in London left town. Curiously, they had a simcha, they had to go away on vacation. There was some reason why they had to leave town. My grandfather, being of Yeki extraction, was not taken by this. Somebody told him that if he meets the Belzer Rebbe, that people are going to be angry with him. He said, I really don't understand what you're talking about. A rabbi comes here, I have to welcome him, and I have to treat him with great respect. And the Belzer Rebbe came, my grandfather went to see him, and my grandfather held him in great reverence and respect, and they told my grandfather that the Belzer Rebbe would like to come and see him in return. It's appropriate that as a visiting rabbi they should visit the rabbi of the community. Well, my grandfather said, no problem, you can come visit me. And they made a time, they said, uh, on Monday, I can't remember the exact details, Monday, 8 o'clock, that the Belzer Rebbe is going to come and visit my grandfather. All right, no problem. The thing is that at 8.45, my grandfather gave a shear, a weekly shear, on Medrash Tanchuma. 8 o'clock came, and my grandfather sitting in his house, waiting for the Belzer Rebbe, and the Belzer Rebbe never came. Because timekeeping is not a strong suit of the Hasidic community. So, my grandfather sitting there, 8.15, he goes to the phone, he had a phone on the landing in his house, he calls whoever it was, and he says, listen, when is the Rebbe coming? And the man said, well, we've been held back, we've got other things that are going on, we're coming imminently. My grandfather said, listen, you don't need to come, because if you don't come in the next 10 minutes, I need to leave at 8.40, because I'm giving a Medrash Tan Chumashir. And I don't want to let those people down. Now, I must tell you, and this I'm, I'm telling you something perhaps it's uh, uh, embarrassing, but my grandfather didn't have a huge crowd of people at his Medrash Tan Chumashir. Maybe he had two or three or five. He didn't have a huge crowd, but nevertheless, his commitment as the Yeki rabbi that he was, was that he was going to give the shir at 8.45, come what may. And whether or not the Belzer Rebbe turned up, he was going to make sure that those people who were coming to his shir were going to hear his shir. The Belzer Rebbe never came. My grandfather went to give the shir, and my grandfather told whoever it was in the Bells community, it's not a problem whatsoever. He doesn't need to see me. He doesn't need to come to my house. Everything is fine. Fast forward 20 or more years. I went to Eretz Yisrael with my son. We went on a vacation together. My son was very young. And my son was a collector of Rebbe cards. You know, it was one of those phases when you had books where you could stick the Rebbe stickers into the pages of a particular book. And I said to my son, is there anybody in particular you would like to see when you visit Eretz Yisrael? By the way, I meant family. I didn't mean to go and see any rabbis. And my son said, I would love to see the Belzer Rebbe. For some reason, the picture of the Belzer Rebbe had made such a strong impression on him that he wanted to see the Belzer Rebbe. I didn't really know what to do. So I called a friend of mine in Yerushalayim. I said, I I've never see been to see the Belzer Rebbe. I remember seeing him as a child when he gave Tish in London, but I have never seen him since then. How would I go about making an appointment to see the Belzer Rebbe? He says, not easy. It's not very easy to go and see the Belzer Rebbe. He gave me a number of one of the Gaboim, Shamosim, Mashpakim, whoever it was. I called up and they told me, come at midnight on whatever night it was, and the Belzer Rebbe will see you. Okay? I went to the Beis Hamikdosh, building in Yerushalayim and somebody showed me to the location where I needed to be in order to wait to see the Rebbe and I met whoever it was um, I think his name is Wolf Klein and I said to him I'm here my name is Pini Dunner I'm here with my son I'm here to see the Belzer Rebbe are you a grandson 
Are we Yosef Tzvi Duna in London? I said, yes, I am. Oh, very good. Wait in this room. So I waited in the room. They told me I could expect a two-hour wait until I got to see the Rebbe. Ten minutes later, somebody knocks at the door and says to me, the Rebbe will see you now. They told me I have to wait two hours. No, no, the Rebbe will see you now. But make sure that you speak to him only in Yiddish because he doesn't understand English and therefore you've got to communicate with him in Yiddish. Okay? They show me into the room. I have a picture here of me, and my son, Shlomo. We went to see the Belzer Rebbe. And the year was, I can't remember exactly, I think it was, it says here that it was 1998. I went to see the Belzer Rebbe. I went into the room. As they showed me in, they said, Rebbe, this is the London Aruv's Einikel. This is the grandson of the Rabbi of London, my grandfather. The Rebbe looked at me, he nodded, they closed the door. I'm standing there in front of him. And I said to him in Yiddish, Rebbe, as ich darf reden in Yiddish, I heard Rabbi that I need to speak in Yiddish, but the Rebbe can ich reden English because the rabbi can't speak in English, I have to tell the rabbi, my son here, the little boy, he doesn't speak any Yiddish. Of Yiddish. Maybe the rabbi can tell me what it is that he wants to tell my son in Yiddish. And ich geim das ibezugn, of English, and I will tell him whatever it is the rabbi tells me, I will say it to him in English. The Belzer Rebbe looked at me. Those of you who have been to the Belzer Rebbe know that he has a very impassive face. He looked at me, and then he turned to my son, Shlomo, and he said to him, What's your name in English? Shlomo, not having understood one word of what the conversation had been previously, said to him, Shlomo, what are you learning? He says to him, I'm learning Mishnayis. Which Mishnayis are you learning? Perfect English. So Shlomo tells him whichever Mishnah he was learning. And the Rebbe goes to the shelf, pulls out a book, it's a Mishnah. Come over here, he says. And Shlomo goes round to the Rebbe, and the Rebbe begins learning the Mishnah together with Shlomo. You know it very well, he said. Thank you. I want to give you a bracha. That you should always be able to learn Mishnah and learn Torah, and you should go in the way of your fathers and your ancestors. Whatever the word is that he used. Your, your father, your grandfather, perfect English. We left, I, I was, um, it was unbelievable because the Belzer Rebbe, who never speaks English, had made a special effort to speak English to my son, to Shlomo. It's a memory I will never forget. I want to go to the next piece. This is also a very personal piece. I was born on the 25th of September, 1970. My father didn't make it to my birth. He was there for, I have four siblings. My father was at all the um, births of my siblings. He wasn't at my birth. Where was he? He was in Heathrow Airport. He wasn't going anywhere. He wasn't coming back from anywhere. But at that particular moment, on the 25th of September 1970, in Dawson Field in Jordan, there was a hijack going on. And one of the people who was caught in the hijack situation was none other than Rabbi Yitzchok Hutner, the Rosh Hashiva of Chaim Berlin. My father at that time was the director 
of the Aguda of the UK, Aguda Israel, and he went to negotiate or to offer certain negotiation terms on behalf of the Aguda and of the Jewish community to the British authorities with regard to the hostages who were caught in Dawson Field in Jordan. As we all know, no one was killed. Baruch Hashem, all the hostages made it out alive, including Rav Yitzhak Hutna. But Rav Yitzhak Hutna was always somebody who was involved in my, as it were, emerging into the world. Because my mother used to constantly rib my father and used to say to him, where were you? You were more is interested in the Rosh Hashiva of Reb Chaim Berlin than you were in your, the birth of your son. In any event, it was a, uh, an opportunity that I had for this particular Sefer. The Sefer is called Torahs Hanozir. As you know, Rabbi Yitzhak Kutner published a number of Svarim. Uh, most of them are called Pachad Yitzchok. Pachad Yitzchok contains all the incredible um, chidushim in Hashkofa of Rabbi Yitzhak Kutner. And they were written up over the years of his many ma'amorim that he gave in Yeshiva Chaim Berlin. But long before there, but before then, in 1932, Rav Yitzhak Hutner published a sefer called Torah Hanozir. What's Torah Hanozir? Torah Hanozir is a sefer that was published by Rav Yitzhak Hutner when he was still a bocher. He was only born in 1906. So in 1932, he was a young man. He published this Sefer, and the Sefer is Chidushim on Meseches Nozir. It's an absolute classic. Torah scholarship of the first order, and many people have commented on it and have looked at it over the years. It was, it's been republished many, many times. Torah San Nozir is a very, very important Sefer a record of the great and wonderful scholarship of Rav Yitzhak Kutner, a student of Slabodka. But he wasn't just a student of Slabodka. When he came to Eretz Yisrael, he fell into the orbit of a very great rabbi, one of the principal late Talmidim of the Nitziv of Elozhin, Rav Avram Yitzhak HaKoyen Kuk. Now Rav Kuk didn't have the yeshiva like the Hebron yeshiva, the Slabotki yeshiva in Hebron. He had a small group of Bochrim used to learn with him in Yerushalayim. It was a yeshiva that eventually became called Merkaz Harav. But in his own life, in Rav Cook's life, he wasn't a great organizer. He had this yeshiva, he had Bochrim, and I have photographs of the Bochrim of the yeshiva at that time. And Rav Hutna was very taken with Rav Cook. In fact, during the massacre of 1929, when Hebron um, was subjected to the pogrom of the Arabs against the Jewish community there, Rav Hutner wasn't there. Many Bochrim were killed. Rav Hutner wasn't there. Rav Hutner was in Yerushalayim. Where was he? He was studying in the yeshiva of Rav Kook. In Torah's Hanozir, the first edition of 1932, we have a Haskoma from Rav Chaim Ozygorzynski. We have a Haskoma of the Dvar Avram of Kovna, of Avram Dobbe Kahana Shapira, and we also have a Haskoma of Rav Kook. Now, the reason why this is so unusual is because in subsequent editions of Torah Hanozir of Rav Hutner, we don't have this Haskoma of uh, Rav Kook. It was removed. Clearly, it wasn't politically correct to include this Haskoma, and it was removed. In fact, Copies of Teres HaNozir that include the Haskoma of Rav Kook, if they ever fall into the hands of people who are devoted Talmidim of Rav Hutna, they will destroy them because they, they claim or they insist that any association between Rav Hutna and Rav Kook will somehow diminish Rav Hutna's standing in the Torah world and they refuse to contemplate or to even consider that Rav Hudna ever thought of Rav Kook as one of his Torah teachers, it doesn't make any sense to them. But here you have it. 
So I bought this Sefer Teres HaNozir. And Rav Hutna has a place which is very close to my heart because he was the rabbi for whom my father sacrificed his time in the very week that I was born. Now, Rav Hutna is an interesting man. He only has one daughter, Rebetzin David. And Rebetzin David, who is the uh, founder and director of BJJ, of Beth Jacob, Jerusalem, the seminary that so many girls have studied in and so many wonderful people have emerged out of, Rebetzin David actually studied in Colombia. Now, the reason I know this, I'm sure you're thinking that Pinney doesn't know what he's talking about. The reason I know this is because she wrote a thesis. And she wrote a thesis about a man called the Maharat Chayas. Who is the Maharat Chayas? Maharat Chayas, you know. He was a commentary on the Gemara in the 19th century. And he was somebody who studied both Haskalah and in the regular yeshiva world. And he emerged as a champion of standard Torah scholarship. But he somehow, he straddled both world, worlds, the world of, world of Haskalah. One of his great teachers was a man called Rabbi Nachman Krochmal. He wrote something called Meri Nebuchim HaChodosh, a very unusual man, somebody who both was a great scholar and a great Talmud Chochem. He was a Shomer Torah Mitzvah, and at the, at the same time he was a radical Maskil, and Rabbi Tzvi Hersh Chayas, the Maharat Chayas, held him in very high esteem, but at the same time, the Maharat Chayas was somebody who never crossed the line, never became a radical Maskil to the extent that he would be excluded from the Torah world. And we know that the Hagos of the Maharat Chayas are in the Vilna Shas. We use them, we accept them, and here we have the, it's, it's quite incredible, that we have the thesis of none other than Rebetzin David. It was published in 1971. I'm not sure if it's available online. I was once able to obtain it um, from a microfilm company. Um, we have the, the thesis of Rebetzin David, an exceptional thesis about the background to the life and works and thoughts and ideals and ideology of the Maharat Chayas. Rav Hutner only had one daughter, Nebuch, she has no children, and nevertheless, she has managed to perpetuate the Torah world, not by having a great yeshiva, but by having one of the great Torah institutions for women, BJJ, which has produced some of the great uh, Jewish women of the Torah world, over the past 50 years, she is somebody who went through Columbia University and produced a quality thesis on the subject of one of the great rabbis of the 19th century. And with this, I'm going to end today. It's a great pleasure spending time with you. Hopefully, I'll be able to introduce you to some other great treasures from my library in the next um, broadcast that I will put together. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Carly, Carly, who is our producer here at Young Israel of North Beverly Hills, who is making a great effort to ensure that both I am able to broadcast to you and that you are able to receive those broadcasts on YouTube and elsewhere. And I'm extremely grateful to her and I'm grateful to you for listening to me and for taking up your time to find out a little bit more about Jewish history through treasures from the Rabbi's Library. Thank you.